The Florida Historical Society presents Florida Frontiers is made possible in part by the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund and by... The historic Rossiter House Museum and Gardens is in the O'Galley section of Melbourne, Florida. Preserved as it was in the early 20th century, historic tours of the Rossiter House include antiques, artifacts, and family heirlooms, and the 1865 Houston Family Cemetery. The last resident of the home was successful businesswoman and philanthropist Caroline P. Rossiter. The historic Rossiter House Museum and Gardens is available for weddings and other special events. The Department of State Division of Cultural Affairs, the Florida Council of Arts and Culture, and the State of Florida. In the spring and summer of 2020, protests for racial justice and equality took place around the world and in every American state, including Florida. Interracial groups were protesting in response to the killing of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and other unarmed African Americans by police officers. In the 1960s, peaceful civil rights demonstrations in Florida were sometimes met with violence. In August 1960, following an attempt to integrate lunch counters in Jacksonville, more than 200 white people wielding baseball bats and axe handles chased African Americans through downtown streets trying to beat them into submission. The attack became known as Axe Handle Saturday. In the summer of 1964, peaceful protesters in St. Augustine were assaulted while attempting to integrate beaches and pools and while marching around the park where the slave market still stands. Historians credit national coverage of the violence in St. Augustine for breaking the stalemate in the United States Congress, allowing the Civil Rights Act of 1964 to be passed. In the spring and summer of 1961, small groups of volunteers called Freedom Riders faced life-threatening violence to integrate interstate travel in the South. Welcome to Florida Frontiers, presented by the Florida Historical Society. I'm Ben Broatmarkle. While the Freedom Rides are now seen as a pivotal point in the civil rights movement, it's often forgotten that two groups of Freedom Riders came to Florida. The idea was to go down the East Coast. It was so concentrated in Alabama and Mississippi, they wanted to test to see if there was compliance with the, with the Supreme Court decisions in South Carolina, North Carolina, and, the, and into Florida. So they came down in these two, two, two different rides, one with 14 and one with 18, and one, one ended up in Tallahassee and one ended up in St. Petersburg. As a student at Florida A&M University in the early 1960s, Cradell Petway peacefully protested for civil rights in the face of violent opposition. As a student at Duke University, Joan Mulholland did the same. Both women became freedom riders and both became aware of racial inequities at an early age. I first became aware, and I think I was about 11 years old, uh, going to junior high school and having to walk past all white schools only to walk about a mile or two further and I didn't understand the why. I just knew that this was not right, this was not doing what we learned in Sunday school about treating people the way we want to be treated and I just sort of knew, couldn't have put it in good words then, but I knew that when I had a chance to help make the South the best it could be. Didn't care about the Yankees, they could take care of themselves, but to help make the South the best it could be for everybody, I would seize the moment. And that came with the sit-ins in 60. They shot water on us from the fire hydrants, sick dogs on us, and threw tear gas into the crowd. And uh, I became nauseated from the tear gas as well as other conditions where we were housed at the fairgrounds. We were told one week by the chaplain that next week some of the students from North Carolina College who were 
involved in the demonstrations in town would come out and talk to us about it. Um, but keep it quiet because administration might lock us out, the police and the rowdies might show up and all that. But they explained very clearly in legal and moral terms about the sit-ins and demonstrations, and then they invited us to join them. So a handful of us did, and the administration went absolutely ballistic. The only thing that kept us from being expelled was the university professors group um, prevailed that we could stay in school. The goal of the Freedom Rides was to integrate interstate transportation in the South. This included bus and air travel and the services provided at terminals. The Supreme Court had already ruled on the matter, so the Freedom Riders were not even breaking the law. Well, not technically, because there were two Supreme Court decisions which said that they had the right to sit anywhere they wanted on the bus, or whether black or white, and they could go anywhere they wanted in the terminal. They could sit at any lunch counter and use any restroom. But those decisions weren't recognized by the kind of white supremacist politicians and leaders of the South. In 1942, James Farmer Jr. was one of the founders of what would become the Congress of Racial Equality, also known as CORE. The organization was dedicated to ending racial segregation in the United States through nonviolence. When Farmer took over as the national director of CORE in 1961, he decided that a freedom ride was needed to make sure that the Supreme Court rulings on interstate travel were being enforced in the South. And he had all this correspondence on his desk about people who had been uh, discriminated against on buses and trains despite the December 1960 uh, Supreme Court decision. So he said, well, this is what a great project for us. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna shock the Kennedy administration into taking civil rights seriously. You know, Kennedy made no mention of civil rights in his inauguration, did not invite Dr. King to the inauguration, talked about spreading freedom all over the world to uh, South America and Africa and Asia, everywhere but Alabama, Georgia, <laughs> Florida. Uh, and so they, they knew that they'd have to do something daring and dramatic to get the attention of the Kennedy administration. It was not only an embarrassment, it was an inconvenience for him at the time. And I thought it was somewhat despicable. Uh, I understand a lot, lot more about politics now than I did then. But he had made certain promises uh, during his campaign with uh, passing the Civil Rights Bill. So I won't say that he didn't intend to pass it, but that was a promise that he made uh, during his campaign. So it was not only an embarrassment, it was an inconvenience at the time with everything else going on. Well, now the Supreme Court in the December before had ruled that there could be no segregation in the vehicles of or the facilities associated with interstate travel. And we were trying to get the Kennedy administration to enforce the Supreme Court ruling, and they were a little reluctant to do anything, you know, international relations, da -de da -de da but they finally saw the light 400 and some arrests later. The first group of Freedom Riders left Washington, D.C. in May 1961 on separate buses bound for New Orleans. They made it as far as Anniston, Alabama, when one bus was attacked and set on fire. The passengers were injured and barely escaped with their lives. Well, the idea was a two-week trip. May 4th, they left Washington. Two buses. These are commercial buses. They're not specially chartered buses or anything. There are other passengers on these buses. One Greyhound, one Trailways. And the idea was to take two weeks to get down to New Orleans and get there on May 17th which was the seventh anniversary of the Brown decision, the school desegregation decision, and they were gonna have a big celebration with activists in New Orleans. And, but they never made it. Or at least they didn't make it in the way they, they intended. I thought it was very horrific. And even to this day, it's unimaginable. And had I not experienced some of it, it would still be hard for me to believe that people were treated in such an inhumane manner. You know, the first week of the ride in the Upper South was pretty um, uneventful until they got to Rock Hill, South Carolina, and then a mob of young Klansmen 
attacked them, beat uh, John Lewis and others. And, uh, uh, and when they, later they got to Atlanta and they met with Dr. King, they had dinner with him, and they tried to enlist him as a writer. Say, well, why don't you come with us uh, to Alabama and to Mississippi and down to New Orleans? And he basically said, uh, thanks, but no thanks. I, uh, my sources in Alabama tell me that the Klan is preparing quite a welcome for you people. And I, if you were smart, you'd probably stop in Atlanta. Don't go on, you're, you're risking your lives. The um, bus was firebombed in Anniston and one of our D.C. area sit-in group members was on that bus. He's in the picture of the folks standing outside it. And so following the teachings of Gandhi, if one falls and can't continue, others have to step up and take their place, you know, like in the Salt March. And um, so freedom, students who had been doing sit-ins across the South, a bunch of them came to keep from different cities, from Nashville, from D.C., from Atlanta, from New Orleans and other places. They came to keep the Freedom Riots going. When they got to Anniston, one of the buses was bombed. They tried to burn them to death on the bus. And only because the gas tank blew up that the Klan fell back and they were able to kick the door off and, and uh, get out. Um, there were badly, a lot of smoke inhalation. And, and the other bus, when it got to Birmingham, Bull Connor, the Commissioner of Public Safety made sure that the Klan had about 20 minutes to beat them. Uh, he said, don't kill them, but I want you to beat them with an inch of their lives so they'll, no Freedom Riders will ever come back to Alabama. And of course, it was, it was done in front of the national press and it, it, it backfired and they, they ended up, in some, several of them in the hospital in Birmingham, and they, but they voted to go on. When the Freedom Rides began, some civil rights activists thought they were too dangerous. But immediately after the violence in Anniston and Birmingham, movement leaders, including Martin Luther King Jr., Ralph Abernathy, and Matthew Petway, decided that the Freedom Rides must continue. Reverend Petway enlisted his son Alfonso, friend Cecil Thomas, and his daughter Cradell to attempt the integration of air transportation facilities. We flew from Montgomery, Alabama to Jackson, Mississippi. When we got to Jackson, Mississippi, the airport terminal was locked. We could not enter. We would walk from the plane round the, uh, and tarmac round to the front. And we stopped to get water. They wouldn't let us drink from the water fountain. My dad was persistent. And I was standing beside him like a two-year-old instead of the 20-year-old that I was. So when he drank, I attempted to drink also, and I was snatched up, you know, uh, by my arm, and he was told, uh, you need to come on with us. They had the paddy wagon waiting, and there were other, I'll say students, that I w was not aware of uh, that they had picked up from some other location, and they took us to Hines County Jail. My group flew from D.C. to New Orleans and took the Illinois Central train back to Jackson. Um, I claim credit for bringing Stokely Carmichael, my buddy, to um, the South because he was in the group and I was in charge of, you know, getting the group recruited. And um, so by then it was absolutely routine. The Kennedy administration had struck a deal with the governor and mayor, there would be no violence in Mississippi like there had been in Alabama, but they could arrest us on a local charge. So it became fill the jails. When we got to the jail, of course, we were fingerprinted and they did the mug shots. Um, I don't know what happened to uh, my bolero to the dress that I had on. And I know I had a small piece of luggage and I don't know what happened to that. And it's, that part is somewhat of a blur after we, after they did the fingerprinting and the mugshot, uh, the next thing I heard was a big clink clink when they put us in the jail cell. Alan Kaysen grew up in the Washington Shores neighborhood of Orlando, Florida, and graduated from the historically black Jones High School in 1960. As a 19-year-old college student in Tennessee, the aspiring writer narrowly escaped a vicious beating during the second Freedom Ride.
Alan was a very studious, uh, sort of a nerd-like kid, very smart, very intellectual. He always has a typewriter with him. He's always writing. And when he, when he was on the bus that went into Montgomery, uh, they were chased by the mob and the, the bus station was right next to the post office. And so he and Bernard and some others leaped over the wall with his typewriter, by the way, his Smith Corona, and they, they, they run into the, for safety, into the post office, you know, and it was just like business as usual. People were, you know, getting their mail and with this riot was going on outside. As the Freedom Rides continued and the riders were arrested, Mississippi's Hines County Jail filled quickly. The decision was made to send the Freedom Riders to the notorious Parchman Penitentiary. In the white women's cell in Hines County, where they were putting Freedom Riders, we were down to less than three square feet of floor space per prisoner, if you don't count the space underneath the low-hanging bunks. And that was real cozy when it was sleeping. One girl slept curled up in the dripping shower every night. People were under the bunks, two on a narrow bunk, and it, the food was lousy. I mean, it bugs in it and stuff. And so getting moved up to Parchment, it was a newer facility, death row, mind you. They put the death row prisoners into better facilities on campus, on, on the farm. But it was roomier, cleaner, and the food was way better than in the county jail. So it was really a step up. But they were trying to intimidate us because it was, had a worse reputation even than Angola prison in Louisiana. Parchman was a real turning point because it, it, it showed that these were not ordinary activists. They, were not, they really weren't susceptible to political pressure. I mean, you could threaten to kill them or you could kill them. You know? They weren't going to stop. I mean, they, they were... They were uh, with what we now call a movement culture. That's what was happening. It's creation of this movement culture where they, they uh, sort of march to their own drummer and uh, they really were beyond the traditional forms of intimidation which had worked so well. Uh, they were willing to die. And, uh, and they just, of course, they drove the white supremacists crazy. I mean, you almost feel sorry for them. They had no idea what they were up against with these, these kids. And, of course, the, the local press in Mississippi and Alabama tried to demonize them as communists, that they were being directed from Moscow or from Havana by Castro and all this sort of thing. And, but as time went on, it became clear that these were just the kids next door. The same week that imprisoned Freedom Riders started being transferred to Mississippi's notorious Parchman Penitentiary, two Freedom Rides came to Florida. One group of Freedom Riders traveled through the center of the state to St. Petersburg. The other group crossed North Florida to Tallahassee. Ferris Bryant was the governor. He was from Ocala. Uh, he was a staunch segregationist, but a pragmatic politician, and he saw what was happening in Mississippi. And, uh, you know, that, he thought that was not good for business, not good for Florida's image. And so even though he wanted to preserve segregation, he didn't want the violence. And so he, he, he made a tremendous effort, frankly, to work with Burke Marshall from the Justice Department to keep the, the, the most violent, most militant white supremacists away from the Freedom Riders. Uh, and so there was no big violence. Now, he wasn't entirely successful. Um, when they got to Ocala, uh, several of the riders were, were, were beaten and imprisoned, and uh, uh, it was uh, not, a, not a happy scene, but they, they had to leave them in Ocala, and then they went on to, to Tampa, where it was also there was a bit of a ruckus in Tampa but minor compared to what was happening in Alabama and Mississippi. From Tampa, the first Florida Freedom Ride made it to the final destination of St. Petersburg. And when they got to St. Petersburg, uh, of course, they had the St. Pete Times, which was probably the most liberal newspaper in the South at the time, it supported desegregation. They did everything they could to give the Freedom Riders a, a nice welcome, frankly. There was one white man who attacked one of the local black Reverend McDonald was attacked outside where they were eating lunch. And, uh, uh, but by and large, there was no violence, and they, they had a big mass meeting at one of the black churches in South St. Petersburg. And uh, so, the, so that, that ride actually, uh, as, the, as the St. Pete Times, they ran an editorial, 
after the Freedom Riders left, saying, uh, we're proud of St. Petersburg, but the way we were able to handle this and that we, we believe in constitutionalism and we believe in racial equality. And one of the first times they'd really been that forthright. I mean, they had supported the Brown decision in 54, but this gave them an opportunity to really say the right things. The second Florida Freedom Ride bus carried an interfaith group of rabbis and clergymen. They made it to their final destination of Tallahassee, but were not warmly received. They come into Sumter and they tried to stay at the Evans Motor Court. <laughs> and the sheriff showed up and threatened to arrest them if they didn't go away. And uh, one of the white supremacists had a pickup truck with, with a, a huge rattlesnake in the back. And he, he, he takes it out and shakes it at the Freedom Riders saying, if you don't get out of here, I'm going to let this snake loose on you guys. And, and uh, so it was a pretty, pretty tense as they, as they came down. They went through Jacksonville and uh, met some local NAACP activists who had been doing some local tests of, 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 of compliance with, with the you know, desegregation. And uh, they went to Lake City and also kind of a mixed reaction there. You know, they kind of tolerated them but let them go, but uh, a, lot of, a lot of screaming at them. And so they get to Tallahassee and uh, um, they really didn't have much trouble desegregating the, the bus terminals. Following a successful bus ride, the Freedom Riders had difficulty at the local airport. A group of riders who had become known as the Tallahassee 10 tried to integrate the restaurant at the airport. When they were denied service, they staged a sit-in. They wouldn't leave. Finally, they closed the airport at midnight and uh, uh, they uh, went back um, and uh, into Tallahassee, and they came back the next morning at 7.30 and continued the sit-in until they let them eat in the restaurant. And uh, the uh, police came, and uh, they were actually on the phone with Burke Marshall in the Justice Department. He was trying to negotiate it, and the, the, the police just panicked and said, you got 15 seconds to get out of here. And they arrested them all and carted them off to jail. And uh, they were convicted of uh, several crimes, um, you know, breach of peace and violating the, the, the uh, ordinance for segre segregation, and, and they went before Judge Rudd, who was this infamous uh, white supremacist uh, in, in Tallahassee, and he convicted them all and gave them a tongue lashing about, go back to your own communities and fix the problems there. We're, we have no problems in Tallahassee, right? The Tallahassee 10 bailed themselves out of jail and continued their civil rights work. Over the next three years, they appeal the decisions. They, they go to the, the circuit court and then to the state Supreme Court and finally to the U.S. Supreme Court. And uh, the U.S. Supreme Court would not uh, you know, set aside the convictions. So in August of 64, after the Civil Rights Act is passed, you know, more than three years after the Tallahassee 10 had spent their time in jail, they come back to Tallahassee and they serve, they serve several days in jail. And, and they're let out, and then in a great triumph, they go over to the restaurant at the airport and have lunch. In the years after the Freedom Rides of 1961, Cradell Petway got married and had children. When she returned to work and applied for a job at the Veterans Administration in St. Petersburg, her past civil rights activities raised some red flags. When I filled out my application, and of course was fingerprinted there, they asked me, had I ever been arrested for a crime? And I answered, no. Well, I didn't think it was criminal activity. So when my fingerprint report came back, I was called to the personnel office. And so she said, uh, one of the questions on there, and I said, no. So she says, we got your fingerprint report back, and it shows something different. And after the assistant personnel officer told me what the report showed, and I said, oh, I didn't consider that a crime. So she said, well, we need an explanation so we, you know, before you're completely cleared. So I explained what had happened, and of course I kept my job. Between 1900 and 1930, there were more lynchings per capita in Florida than in any other state. In 1920, the Ku Klux Klan held a parade through downtown Orlando, and when a black man attempted to vote, he was hung and riddled with bullets. On Christmas night, 1951, educator and activist Harry T. Moore was assassinated, making him the first martyr of the contemporary civil rights movement. 
These are just a few examples of Florida's atrocious record of civil rights violations, but the state is often left out of discussions of the struggle for civil rights. The Freedom Rides of 1961 are seen as a pivotal point in the civil rights movement, but the Florida Freedom Rides are often overlooked. You've been watching Florida Frontiers presented by the Florida Historical Society. Visit us anytime on the web at myfloridahistory.org. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ben Brokemarkle. The Florida Historical Society presents Florida Frontiers is made possible in part by the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund and by The historic Rossiter House Museum and Gardens is in the O'Galley section of Melbourne, Florida. Preserved as it was in the early 20th century, historic tours of the Rossiter House include antiques, artifacts, and family heirlooms, and the 1865 Houston Family Cemetery. The last resident of the home was successful businesswoman and philanthropist Caroline P. Rossiter. The historic Rossiter House Museum and Gardens is available for weddings and other special events. The Department of State Division of Cultural Affairs, the Florida Council of Arts and Culture, and the State of Florida.